I'm excited to be here and talk about Worldwide Telescope. And uh, a little bit about the history of Worldwide Telescope. There's sort of been three waves that we're going to be talking about. The first wave of Worldwide Telescope was about two years ago when we first launched the Worldwide Telescope uh, at the TED conference. And then the second wave happened about a year ago when we started uh, expanding beyond the first cloud to bring in another cloud, that being NASA's data cloud of over 100 terabytes into Worldwide Telescope, and also to allow the, the addition of um, additional uh, user, data, uh, user data from professors and other scientists trying to do work within WWT. And so the third wave we're going at now, that will be up sometime soon, is the integration of data and data visualization, interactive data visualization and time within the Worldwide Telescope environment. So this is a slide uh, that sort of talks about the beginnings of Worldwide Telescope. I actually was uh, in high school. I got a chance to work uh, at the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles where I grew up. And, uh, and as high school student, our job, there were two of us, was uh, to actually take photographs using these uh, plates of potential flare stars. And we'd be running the telescope all night and capture these images and maybe get like two plates worth of, of data. And that's kind of like the old days of small data. And uh, it's kind of interesting for me to be here, you know, 40 years later talking about big data and uh, astronomy. But it's actually the whole idea of astronomy and astronomy and education has been something that has been of interest to me for a long, long time. Um, Back in 2000, uh, Jim Gray and, and Gordon Bell uh, would come by my office regularly, and one of the times I came by, he started talking about uh, the work that Jim Gray was doing with uh, Alex Zale at Johns Hopkins on the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And, and Jim was working with Alex to help them sort of think about some of the challenges of throughput with big data. And part of what they wanted to do, they had so much data coming from the Sloan, if you think about my little plate from 40 years earlier, it was just a, quite, just a little bit of data. Well, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, if you're not familiar with it, is a multi-spectral sensor that essentially has the telescope point to a place in the sky and essentially scans the sky the entire night. So they're getting a massive amount of data. And so part of the challenge with the Sloan is how do they sort of manage the data pipeline and much less also, how do they start to make that data uh, more accessible and to be able to do science on it? And so Jim and Alex uh, worked on a, on a relatively famous paper called, uh, it's right here, it's called Databases Meet Astronomy. And at the very last page of that PowerPoint, uh, Jim said, we need Viz help and we know it. And uh, so I wanted to be one of the first to volunteer because I was trying to find a way to kind of get back to my roots and do this idea that I had, which uh, is related to astronomy. And uh, so he says, well, you can help us with the, the, with the website uh, and so I helped them design the DR2 website, but that was just kind of the beginning. But that did substantially help um, the education efforts of the Sloan in terms of making that data more accessible uh, for students and the public. But my idea, I, I pitched to uh, Alex and uh, Jim, was this thing I called the Universe Project. And I've been thinking about this for like 30 years. I mean, students, especially somebody like myself that's lived in a major metropolitan area, and I think 70% of students today in the United States live in major metropolitan areas, I never saw the Milky Way until I was like 18. And so the opportunity to be able to see the stars is kind of a, uh, not a particularly common thing. And the other thing is that students today are starting to see big images from the Hubble and the Chandra and Spitzer, and these are beautiful images, but I'm betting 99% of them have no idea where that object is in the sky and what is going on with that object. So for me, I was very interested in expanding beyond data. Okay, and I pitched to Jim, I said, what's well, really a, a big opportunity is data provides a foundation, but above that, we need to create a larger context for the imagery and the sky. And then within that environment, I want to create a rich, simple annotation environment. So astronomers, educators can tell stories about the universe that can engage people and then facilitate the process of discovery and then connecting with data underneath it. So, Jim was a huge fan, and it took me about uh, three years before I could finally get around to it, but we did, we did build it. I think one of the first challenges was to put together the sort of initial image base layer from which the context in visible light where all the other imagery would be. And this was the, uh, there were 3,600 plates from the uh, Palomar Digital Sky Survey. 
essentially there were pairs of red, green, blue, blue light images, and those were 23K by 23K uh, pixel images. And part of the challenge is we stitched it together, but it still ended up looking, you know, quite like a mosaic. It actually looked more like a disco ball. But, um, but the place had all kinds of interesting artifacts, and, and um, just recently, last uh, a number of months ago, Jonathan Fay and some great help from Hughes Hop Hoppy uh, had developed some image processing algorithms using Dryad. And uh, on the cluster, they were able to process this into a, a new trillion pixel image, which is uh, uh, quite beautiful. You don't see any of the artifacts before. There's some details about that process. So, you know, putting together the terapixel sky was kind of one challenge. And another challenge was just moving data around. In the early days when we wanted to move 10 terabytes of data and get it up into the, the cloud, I mean, it would take forever if we were just trying to, to push it through no matter how fast the connection. And we were just moving, you know, terabyte disks around the country with FedEx. It was the fastest way, it was the most paralyzable way sort of to get the data across. And so there are a number of different opportunities about the big data with Worldwide Telescope, but I'm gonna just jump into Worldwide Telescope and uh, sort of show it to you that way. So just out of curiosity, how many people here um, have seen Worldwide Telescope? Can I see a great show of hands? Oh good, not too many. Okay, so um, this, is, this is Worldwide Tel Telescope. Is there a way to lower that, those lights too? That's good. Okay, so you're looking at the Milky Way here, and this is our um, terapixel image. Uh, you can essentially go anywhere and sort of scroll forward and sort of seamlessly see uh, galaxies and such. Another important thing about this, I mentioned the idea of context. So in the sky, this shows you here at the bottom where the Earth is in the celestial sphere. This yellow rectangle is the field of view that we're looking at, and that's also reflected in this blue rectangle here. So as I scroll forward, you can see that blue rectangle shrink, and this little wedge in the sky actually shrinks as well. So this helps you sort of get a sense of both the, the scale of the context of what you're looking at as well. Now we have a number of all sky views in Worldwide Telescope, and this was really important to try and uh, convey the, the kind of structures that are visible in different wavelengths of light. So this is from the Palomar, it's visible light. This is from the WMAP, which is the cosmic background radiation. This is dust. This is infrared. This is the hydrogen alpha. You can go over to uh, the X-ray. And I can actually select this as a foreground layer and, uh, and have two different wavelengths going. Now, each of these data sets are highly precision registered. So I can go and compare data structures between the heat signature and X-ray of this supernova remnant with the physical uh, debris clouds of the Cygnus loop right there. So I'm going to go back to visible light. Now, I mentioned the idea of guided tours. So in the guided tours in Worldwide Telescope is really important that anybody be able to create a tour. These tours are essentially uh, created like PowerPoint, but they're just passed within this really, really rich visual environment. So if I click on uh, the Milky Way is door. a spiral galaxy, but it's hard to see that because we're inside it. Here's a spiral galaxy not far from us, about 12 million light years away, called M81. If we look at it in optical light, we see billions of stars shining together in a spiral pattern. If we look at the heat from M81 rather than the light, it looks like the false color orangey image we see here. This Spitzer Space Telescope image uses long wavelength cameras that can see heat, just like the one that took the picture of this cat. Galaxies are filled with tiny particles called dust that absorb the... So I'm going to pause that a minute. What you're watching has the same feel, like a great sort of nature documentary. It's got music, it's got narration, it's got you know, graphics and animation, but it's not a video. I mean, the problem with video is video is sort of this monolithic object. You can't sort of break into or out of it. But here, the video is essentially, what feels like video is just the path in the data environment. So I'm looking at this particular galaxy here, and you could look at that galaxy from sort of any other, any other telescopes. These are from the, from the Spitzer. Uh, if I wanted to see uh, an X-ray view where the supermassive black hole in the center of that galaxy is, you could see that. 
Um, if I wanted to get more information about this galaxy, I would just have to right click and would bring up this little finder. And the finder would connect me with other information about this particular object. If I was a kid doing schoolwork, I might want to look in Wikipedia and I'll go get a, a Wikipedia entry. If I was an astronomer and I wanted to get access to what are the papers that have been written about this particular galaxy from the Smithsonian Astrophysical Database, and it'll pull up, depending on how fast it is, um, out of 2,586 papers, the most recent paper of the last 200, like I said, it's coming. Um, if I wanted to get an original source image, there you can see it, that one, most recent one was from October. If I wanted to get uh, original source image, I don't have to necessarily know where those servers are. I just say I want a DSS image or I want a Sloan image, and it just goes and gets it for me. So this idea of story connected with context and exploration coupled with access to data, I think is a very, very powerful uh, model for how we might both communicate as well as learn. So down here, we were on this tour, and we could actually branch off to other tours that relate to this particular galaxy. So if the particular thing you were watching and you found something that was a particular interest, you could drill down deep into something, or I could just Galaxies are filled with tiny particles. pick up where I left off. So I'm going to pull up another tour that will talk uh, a little bit about uh, bigger data, if you will, in terms of how we represent that in Worldwide Telescope. So this is a, a tour here. And I'll start it. So I just have some text up here, because you can do that with anyone. But this, this is a view of the Coma Galaxy um, in, the um, in the sky. And the Coma Galaxy is, um, you'll notice that the galaxy in there look a little, a little bit different. Each one's, uh, they're ones that are different sort of size, different shape. That's because the million galaxies that are here that we've rendered are, uh, they have the metadata from them from um, a crowdsourcing website called galaxyzoo.org. And in Galaxy Zoo, um, the process of providing metadata for a million galaxies would take many, many years, given the number of astronomers that there are you know, in the world. But, the, but this was able to be done relatively quickly um, thanks, to that, uh, thanks to the site. And then we were able to integrate that metadata into the representation. So I'm going to jump forward. And here we're showing a large uh, a view of large-scale structure of the universe. About 24 years ago, um, John Hupra from Harvard CFA and Margaret Geller had 18,000 galaxies. And that's when they first noticed some of the larger structures and the bubble voids. Uh, and uh, Hupra was a big fan of Worldwide Telescope. It's really kind of a tragedy that he passed away last weekend. But I wanted to sort of dedicate this talk to him. So um, we'll sort of seamlessly go down to um, the solar system, and we'll take a look at uh, a little bit more data that's being represented here. So we're zooming in on the uh, half a million near-Earth objects, objects that are about a school bus size or larger. So let's go take a look at um, an Excel spreadsheet. So here I can get. Um, this is some data from USGS. It just has time, lat long, uh, magnitude, and depth. And there's about 35,000 rows of data in here. We can take this data and um, bring it into the telescope. And we can paste this here. We can just call this uh, 202010. And um, Bingo, so that's all the data, all the earthquakes. But I don't actually like how that looks. I'm actually going to delete some of these other files in here. OK. So we can look at these properties related to this. I want to change the scale of the representation of those quakes. They're a little bit smaller. And probably adjust the uh, latency and have the time be there. And we'll have the hover state tell us what the magnitude is. So here you can sort of see the 
quakes that we all kind of know. Here's follows the pattern of the San Andreas. Uh, if you look down here, but you notice something unusual. Because we have depth data, the uh, quakes actually follow the subduction zones that uh, from the Pacific plate going into the North American plate. If you go over to here, you can see the Haiti earthquake. Actually, it probably looks better if we make that red. So let's go make that red and it'll look a little bit more dramatic. And I think the Haiti earthquake was particularly damaging because if you look at it, it was pretty close to the surface given its magnitude. If we go over here, up above Puerto Rico, there's a whole swarm of earthquakes happening here. Now, I'd really like to kind of see if there are actually any temporal patterns here. So we can go and um, select time series for that data and crank up the clock in Worldwide Telescope so that we'll be seeing essentially about, uh, you know, a year's worth of data in about 10 seconds. So now you're seeing some interesting patterns that look like lightning bolts, even though that's a question of periods of time over kind of months. Let's go look around some other places on the Earth and see what else we might be seeing. This area here above New Zealand is actually one of the fastest subduction zones on the planet. And in fact, if we uh, turn around and look at it this way, you can see that uh, these quakes are go, go down about 500,000, I mean 500 kilometers below the surface. So let's do something else. Let's, um, let's take a pause here. I'm going to go get some other data. And um, I've got some uh, earthquake data from 2000, which has about 40,000 rows. And um, bring up Worldwide Telescope. And we'll paste it into there, too. So this will be 2000. So now we have two different data sets going on in here. We've got the white ones, which are 2000, and we've got uh, red ones, which are this past year. And let's take the uh, 2010 and let that thing go. That looks good. And what we can do now is we can start to compare one period with another. Let's take a look at Chile. Chile is kind of interesting because scientists have been looking at this coast of Chile for quite a while. I think over a period of years, they've noticed that it was really quiet down here. And you can sort of see how that area just gets filled in. I slowed down the clock a little bit. right there. But this happens to be earthquake data, but maybe it, what I want to do is I want to uh, suppose it was something other than stuff in the ground. We wanted to make that data in the air. So we'll switch that into altitude. So now we can sort of benchmark one sort of data set over another from static data to dynamic data. It's probably going a little too fast. But anyway, that's just sort of an example of how we might be able to start to make sense of some of these uh, 
large data sets in those spreadsheets that we were looking at, there was no way you would get any sense of what the uh, kind of patterns that you saw in uh, Puerto Rico or either um, you know, down here in Chile. So I'm going to stop that. So sort of a third uh, potential application, I think, for this is about how scientists might start using Worldwide Telescope. So Alyssa Goodman, who is an astronomer at Harvard, um, I asked her to uh, give me an example of the kind of w ways that she uses Worldwide Telescope um, to, to communicate with some of her colleagues about some research that the, she's doing. And the usefulness of this is that there, the, the old way of doing this, she'd have to get a bunch of different images from a bunch of different places. And sometimes she'd have to load them all into Photoshop or start doing this sort of manual comparison. Or she said some, some astronomers actually would print stuff out and use a ruler for things. And it was you know, quite primitive. But here, because a lot of these data sets are all resident in Worldwide Telescope, she can bring uh, she can create a path, uh, a narrated path, where she can add text, she can put in narration, bring in her own data, and start to explain some of the problems and what she's looking for. And I'll, I'll play this so you can get a sense of it. This here. is a demonstration of the kind of information I want to give my colleagues about what the importance of bubbles in the interstellar medium might be in terms of driving turbulence inside of molecular clouds. So I'm going to highlight two regions, Orion and Ophiuchus, and then I'm going to zoom in on some information, including some research data about just Ophiuchus. And then the tour shows you uh, what happens when you zoom out to the whole galaxy and use the glimpse survey from Spitzer to see where bubbles might be distributed over the whole plane of the galaxy. This first orangey image that you see is a map of the thermal emission from dust in the galaxy. And I'm about to highlight two molecular clouds that are shown well in this image. The two regions are two of the closest molecular clouds, Orion and Ophiuchus. So they look really big on the sky. We're going to focus on Ophiuchus. And the bar, the white dotted bar, shows you about 30 parsecs at the 120 parsec distance of Ophiuchus. Now we're just going to zoom in from a 60 degree high view of Ophiuchus to a 15 degree high view, which means the top to bottom scale be about 60 parsecs at the distance of Ophiuchus. Now we're going to switch from this Schlegel, Finkbeiner, and Davis view, which shows the ring outlined in white right in the middle of the screen, uh, to a multicolor view. Iris uses different far infrared wavelengths to represent different colors. Now we're just going to zoom in a little more so it's about eight parsecs from the top to the bottom of the screen. Now we start getting to the really tricky part of the Ophiuchus story. The ring is outlined here in yellow, and that's probably blown by a real star named Werewolf that I'll show you in a minute. But the bottom of the screen shows you uh, a kind of blurry view, but of a young cluster, a famous young cluster of stars embedded in the main part of the molecular cloud that's called Row Wolf, even though you can see that's about two degrees away on the sky. For reference, we can overlay a scuba 850 micron image and see all the very young sources. So now we've got rid of the scuba and we have the iris image again. And if we fade to H alpha, you can see the ionized gas forming a nice kind of circular volume around some star. And if we fade out the H alpha to a plain optical image, it's very clear that there's a star right in the middle of the circle, which happens to be rho of the most likely cause of this. So now that we can see this all so clearly in the optical, the question is whether or not you can see anything in the molecular gas. Is this really a wind or just an ionized region? So we can jump forward. You can sort of get a sense of some of these other data sets that she's using for comparative purposes of the GLIMP survey, which is the uh, infrared survey from the Spitzer Space Telescope at the plane of the, of the galaxy. And again, here compared with the visible light view of the Milky Way, you know, ending with sort of this question. So that sort of gives you a sense of how that kind of annotation might be done. But actually, 
you know, astronomy is not the only thing you can do with this engine. I mean, it also applies to other kinds of um, potential experiences. Uh, earlier, there was some talk about digital heritage. And so in Dunhuan, uh, at the Dunhuan Academy, they're very interested in providing some context for visitors in terms of where the caves are in relation to the visitor center that's going to be there. And so very quickly, we put together this guided tour, which sort of shows where the site is in China. And this is based on some imagery from a visit where the group of us, including some of the people here in the audience, were actually out in the field where the visitor center was going to be. So he just gave me the actual plot plan that they had from it, and we just put that here into Worldwide Telescope. They had other imagery from the building, and so um, I just dropped that in here. Other elevation images. I'm just jumping forward here. And so this sort of shows you where the caves are. So all this imagery here is many hundreds of terabytes of imagery from the virtual Earth servers uh, underneath this that allows you to look at the Earth, you know, from a variety of different uh, ways, either mapping or straight imagery. Here's the Mugao Caves, which is in this oasis in the desert. Inside of this uh, cave is a 110-foot Buddha. And so this is the location of Cave 85, which is where the Getty Foundation is sponsoring some restoration in that particular cave. And so they gave me these equirectangular images that they had uh, already created about the interior of the cave, and I just Recently brought those here into Worldwide Telescope. Academy and the Getty Conservation Institute to conserve Cave 85, a large Tang Dynasty grotto. The shrine was commissioned in 862 by Zai Ferong, the powerful head of a family in the Dunhuang region, and completed some five years later. Over the centuries, however, Cave 85 has been considerably damaged, like other caves at ground level. Its floor was flooded in the past when they thought. So like all the other tours, you're just in this another visual data environment that you can decide to pause and explore any other part of it that you decide you want to. You know, we could jump forward, we could jump back, jump to another sort of view of the cave. Um, all of these things are possible just because of the simple infrastructure we have in order to do this. So I'm going to pop back to my slides here. And um, and conclude. This is the uh, technical architecture for Worldwide Telescope. We started with one cloud from a number of surveys. NASA, as I said, mentioned, came in with another uh, cloud full of uh, uh, the super high res imagery from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, as well as the uh, the, uh, the lunar, uh, lunar reorbiter orbiter as well. Um, and hopefully over time, there'll be more and more data sets that will, um, people will host in this sort of common format. The idea is that the, the user has no idea and should need to care about where the data clouds are. They're just all available within this simple, rich environment. And they're available for sort of adding your sort of metadata and paths within it. This is just still about sort of future telescopes that are coming in terms of the larger sensors. And uh, of course, the corresponding amount of data. So how do we deal with that much data? I mean, crowdsourcing is certainly an opportunity given the things which happened with Galaxy Zoo, perhaps machine learning from training sets from crowdsourced data. But I really also think that compelling and natural user interfaces like Worldwide Telescope and providing data services that allow really simple creation of metadata and a combination of all these efforts is really the way we can start to handle big data going forward in the future. What I'd like to do is, uh, yep, yeah, yeah, oh, three more things. Um, <laughs> these are sort of the, the three ideas that are really important to us in Worldwide Telescope. The idea of rich guided paths through data clouds in terms of being able to, uh, to you know, at any point interact and explore. The idea of contextual visualization and the idea of an intuitive user interface for, for broader public access to the data. So this is the URL, it's the .org. And what I'd like to do uh, is I'd like to introduce Professor Kui, who's going to talk about um, the applications of Worldwide Telescope here in China and some of the exciting developments that he's been uh, working on. Dr. Kui. Thanks, Curtis. 
Just now, uh, Curtis gave us a background and uh, some uh, uh, powerful uh, demo demonstration about the World Wide Telescope. My talk will focus the activities in China. I came from the National Astronomical Observatory, an institute uh, seems very far from computer science. However, we have close and very well collaboration with, uh, with computer scientists. Uh, several years ago, Dr. Jim Gray gave a very friendly name for the effort, Worldwide Telescope. In professional, in professional astronomy, we have another name uh, for this effort, almost the same meaning, Virtual Observatory. Virtual Observatory is a data intensively online astronomical research and education environment, taking advantages of advanced information technologies to achieve seamless global access to astronomical information. We know the power of the World Wide Web uh, is, is transparency. It seems that almost all the documents are housed in UPC. The Virtual Observatory hopes to achieve the same transparency and to uh, link together various of resources for the astronomers and for the public. Virtual Observatory mm, not only belongs to astronomy, there are many virtual observatories in space science, in earth science, and uh, uh, other similar uh, communities. Uh, currently, there have been about uh, 20 uh, virtual ob observatory projects worldwide. And the Chinese virtual observatory program is a national real product in China initiated in 2002. At the same year, Dr. Jim Gray visited the National Astronomical Observatory and visited the, the China Wheel product. With, with his suggestion and recommendation, we joined the dust from the International Virtual Observatory Alliance at that year. During the, during the last uh, uh, several years, the China Wheel program uh, had, has established a very good team, including uh, several core partners uh, and some collaborators, mainly from the Chinese universities and observatories. And uh, we also established good collaboration with some external collaboration, uh, collaborators. The Microsoft Research and uh, Microsoft Research Asia are key partners on uh, uh, education and uh, uh, popularization. And we hope in the future we will have more collaboration on astronomical research. The so World War Telescope, this package, was released officially on May 12th, 2008, the same day, uh, the same day as the Wenchuan earthquake a very important day uh, for the Chinese. Uh, our collaboration with the Microsoft Research started at the same time. Uh, in, in the June issue of Amateur Astronomer, a very popular magazine in China, we released a short notice for the release of the Worldwide Telescope. And in the July issue of that magazine, I wrote this paper, uh, Astronomy in Google Sky and the World Wide Telescope Area. 2008 uh, was the 10 years anniversary. For the MSRA 10 years anniversary, collab collaborating with the colleagues from Microsoft Research, we prepared a guided tour uh, to tell a story to tell the Chinese volunteer story. Uh, its Chinese name is Niu Lang Zhi Nu Qi Xi Xiang Hui. Because of the tour is uh, so popular and interesting, finally, we got 
a best uh, demonstration award at the anniversary. From that, uh, from that point, working together with several uh, colleagues from the Microsoft Research, we gave a series of uh, lectures and uh, tutorials in different Chinese cities, for example, Beijing, Wuhan, and Shanghai. Each, each one will get very positive feedback from the audience. So uh, their feedback encourages us to advocate to prove our work for the worldwide telescope in China furthermore. Uh, during the last two years, we established the, the worldwide telescope a community, Beijing, and we provide Chinese interface for the WRT, and set up community server and resource mirror and cache the backend data of the WRT. And we also organize the few students uh, and the teachers to translate the English tutorials and the documents into Chinese so that uh, more people can get the information uh, from the, double, uh, from the uh, internet, from the website. And uh, we also open a special session, uh, online forum for the WWT community. This one is a Chinese version of the WWT. And here is a website for the WWT community, Beijing. Here is a online forum for the community. I'm sure many of us will not uh, forget, will not forget the total solar eclipse uh, in China last year. Microsoft Research Asia and the National Astronomical Observatories, uh, together with other partners uh, in China, we organized uh, a large-scale live broadcast for the total solar eclipse along the Yangtze River. We selected 11 observation sites along the solar eclipse belt and uh, send back the signals to a central node and then broadcast to the world to provide public signals. The final results are very exciting. We got huge audience. For example, uh, here is the uh, logos for our clients of the live broadcast. We got 30 signed clients, including 17 network portals, 10 TV stations, one mobile phone portals, and two IPv6 portals, yeah, including the CNN uh, and, a and the AP from America and ABC from Japan and from uh, some other countries. We originally, we, we can't believe the results of the click, but uh, it is realized uh, in the end. The total click of the website reached 230 million. It, it is very huge, very high. This picture shows audience from a Canadian observatory to watch the live broadcast of the solar eclipse. Maybe you will wonder here, where is the WRT? Yeah, we, in the live broadcast, we use WRT as a backup in case all our observed our, our observe sites can't get solar eclipse signals because of bad weather, we will use WRT to simulate the solar eclipse and the broadcast to the world. Of course, we will note the audience it was not low signals but simulated by the WRT. Fortunately, the weather was not so bad. We watched three times total uh, solar eclipse in Chongqing, Yichang, and Wuhan. To further our collaboration between the observatories and the 
Microsoft Research. And uh, advocate the WWT application and the effect uh, in China. In the year, we organized uh, uh, a guided tour design contest uh, for Chinese spoken areas. We feel it is important uh, to the success uh, of the contest if we provide user-friendly materials and back-end uh, information for the, for the users. So we invite professional astronomical artists to design the website and uh, the poster. And we also pr prepared a trailer because of time. I will not show uh, the trailer here. In addition uh, to the contest uh, preparation, to involve, to, to invite as much as uh, students, as more students to take part in the contest. In August, we organized a teacher training for the WRT in Beijing Normal University. Limited by the uh, computer room of the university, there are about 40 uh, teachers from different parts of China attended the training. And we also get very positive feedback from the teachers. And so we decide next year we will organize the second training. For the contest, we take advantages from various network media. For example, academic portals, public portals, blogs, and Twitter similar portals. Why similar but not Twitter? Because Twitter is blocked in China. And uh, we use video portals and forums to uh, advocate uh, the, for the contest. Here is a news report from the National Astronomical Observatory. And this one from Chinese Academy of Sciences. Sina.com, QQ.com, and Soho.com, this very uh, popular uh, po network portals, all of them follow the contest. And this is one, is UQ, a video portal in China. Yeah, we also use a blog. For example, this one is Amazon Space for the contest. I'm sorry to hear that the Amazon Space will be closed very soon. And this one is a Sina, uh, Sina Twitter, the website for the Microsoft Research Asia. In the in the following five minutes, I will show four tools, selected tools from the contest, to show different uh, functions of the WWT guided tool from different aspects. Yeah. This tool is give us an introduction about the solar system and the universe in a traditional, in a traditional style. First, it will give us a, a whole impression about the universe, the Milky Way, and the zoom in to the solar system. Following that, The author will give us a brief description about some well-known deep space objects. This tour is prepared by a small team, one student in China and one student in Singapore. To prepare a WWT tour, it does like for you to do a PPT slice. And the result is, is like a short film. So it is a very good tool 
for education and for your uh, research results. Okay, the next one I will show you. This tour is a story, is to tell a story about the author, to watch, to observe the solar eclipse uh, in last year. The author, the hometown of the author, yeah, is a location in China. And uh, he has simple telescope and to watch the solar eclipse. This is a telescope of the author. And uh, they were observing the eclipse. This is a simulation from the WT for that place. And uh, in the following part of the tour, the author will give a brief introduction about the whole process of the solar eclipse. Yes. The third one is prepared by a staff from Beijing Planetarium. So she, use, she uses worldwide telescope to introduce the exhibitions in the Beijing Planetarium. Here is the location of the Beijing Planetarium. Very near to the Beijing Zoo, most of us, uh, especially Beijingers, know the police very well. This, yeah, the, the, the images are exhibitions in the Beijing Planetarium and the song is from the WT. And this one is an exhibition about Mercury, Mars, and Earth. The last one is another story about environment protection. Yeah, I'm sorry if you can read, if you cannot read Chinese, uh, maybe you don't know what the author to say. Because the author, the name of the author is I'm fine. The name of the author is I'm fine. She, he's a guy from Mars. And uh, he will observe our Earth and uh, tell, the, the, tell the Earth, tell the citizen on Earth, the Earth will be fine in the future. So if only we take, take care of the Earth, our future is bright. Very beautiful countries. However, because of the increase of our temperature, Many island countries will disappear uh, in the next uh, tens of years. And they also, also care about uh, bears because they don't know their future. Yeah, they are looking for their future. I just stop here because of time. You know, we, as, as we learn from these tours under the lecture of Curtis, the WWT is a good result for the collaboration of computer scientists and astronomers and the public. And I also feel 
the WWT, the World Wide Scope, is an ideal, is an ideal platform for the concept and the power of e-science and the data intensive science and the citizen science. Thank you. Thanks. Do you want do you want to get some questions? Okay. Is there any questions that we can answer? While we're waiting, I forgot to say a couple of things. I was showing the Sloan galaxies out there, but I didn't take the time that I could, of course, pick any one of those million galaxies and then right click and pull up. Uh, a page from directly from Sloan with one click, which would pull up the image of the galaxy, the spectrum, and you can download the actual data itself. Sort of closing that loop like what we talked about earlier. Um, no other questions? Is that a hand back there? I can't really see. I guess not. Okay. Um, I guess that's it. We'll give you the time back. Thank you.